I have Ali Bashavan, and his presentation is on practical network security automation. Ali is from the Coles Group Limited. If you can give him a welcome applause, guys. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for making the time. We should all be sober by now, hopefully. And should I need more coffee? Um, so, practical network security automation is the topic for this presentation. So, just to give you a view on uh, what's ahead of us in this presentation, I'll briefly cover the current landscape, some of the challenges and expectations from us. Then uh, we'll go through uh, different flavors of automation and why we shouldn't be calling everything AI and it, because it's just cool or it's automated. Um, then we'll hopefully get to the more exciting part that is the two use cases that I've selected. The first one is a reactive use case um, where we see um, how automated thread blocking could work. And the second one is uh, more of a proactive nature so to implement a WAF in front of an API gateway. Towards the end, um, we'll have a look at a summary and hopefully I'll give everyone something to take away from this talk and if I manage my time well, I should be able to take some questions. We'll see. So what are we dealing with? I would like to put a few things into perspective and no matter where you are in the hierarchy, they have an impact on you. So the growth in cybercrime. And I promise I'm not going to use the term cyber anything after this slide. So we'll see increasing number of cybercrime activity and we see more cyber criminals that are better equipped and are better organized. So let's say 15, 20 years ago, it's not that there were fewer smart people on the planet who were capable of doing outstanding cybercrime. I guess we were dealing with smart individuals who were less organized and had access to limited resources. But today, cybercrime as a service has pretty much bridged that gap. So this is now turned into a very lucrative business for, for those who know how and um, where to go and obtain the different pieces of puzzle so then they can pull off a true global operation. And, and sadly, still, it, it's worth a try for the board or the idiots or the near-do-wells. a wider attack surface. So pretty much a byproduct of utilizing more tech. We have more data stored and accessed outside the organization's four walls than ever before, for sure. And we have more devices that are inside our networks, but they want to call home. They just want to be managed from outside our organization. Yep, we, we have to move faster and everything is agile. So what are our mantras? Lean and fail fast. So we're less willing to spend time on elaborate discovery and prolonged design and endless planning because, because the world around us is just moving too fast now. We, we can't really, we don't have that time anymore. And resource challenges, probably for most organizations, is not monetary resources, it's, it's people. So it's, it's difficult to find the right people. It's, it's not easy to keep them motivated, and, and definitely it's not easy to retain them. Then we get to the classic dollar figures for your OPEX and CAPEX, and, and also the organization's ability to manage and deliver projects and programs and roadmaps, which takes a lot of human intellect. So this is a fun slide. 
if I had one of these, I could pretty much conclude the talk. We could just head to an early lunch. But I tried to buy one of these online for myself and my boss just to remind him more to the point that they may exist, but they can't really fix everything. And, and to be honest, it wasn't easy. So I spent a good 10, 15 minutes just searching through the results of different things. And I managed to find one that was also a USB storage, so it wasn't totally useless. So then that was pretty cool. But jokes aside, Automation is an area that can definitely help us. So it scales well, better than we do. It moves faster than us. And I'll start saying that. Um, it's reliable and it's accurate. And the general disclaimer there is the usual garbage in, garbage out. So it, that rules always applies. So. Quick clarification of, on um, what do we mean by automation. I'll be using IEEE's uh, terminology here. I'll have this arrow on the side for us to better associate um, each category of software with um, doing versus thinking. And I'll start with robotic desktop automation. So we're talking about an application that has a set of predefined steps to complete an activity or a process. And these steps could be across uh, multiple different systems. The, the important thing here is the, the operator still initiates and manages the workflow through. Then comes the robotic process automation. So the, the software is getting smarter the application uses business rules, or, and, and it does it autonomously to execute those activities or processes. And the important factor here is the operator only manages the exceptions. So this is, so this is the process-driven territory where the focus is automating repetitive tasks. So pretty much, we, we're trying to mimic human actions. Then we get to the data-driven territory, where the focus kind of changes towards um, learning and thinking. And the important facet here is you have to have access to good quality data. And, and again, with the goal to, to, to simulate human intelligence. So we start with machine learning here, where we feed an application a, a lot of data. So these are captured successful and or unsuccessful operations. So we, we're essentially teaching the software. So or, or the software is observing on our, our actions. And, and the end goal here is for the software to be able to detect and recognize and recognize patterns and correlate so they eventually can provide us predictions or decisions, if you like. And the holy grail of AI, which it's the combination of pretty much everything. So mouthfuls like cognitive automation or machine learning, um, reasoning, analysis, natural language processing, they all combine here. And the, the end goal is to produce insight and analytics at or above the human capability. So this is where it gets a little bit scary or uh, human ego confronting. So that, that should be enough dose of intelligent process automation. And with that out of the way, I can, I can tell you that most of this presentation is focused in the process-driven area. So I'll comfortably leave the data-driven area to uh, smarter presenters. So I'll try to set the scene for the first use case a bit. So 
security teams are usually tasked to protect our people, our compute, our data, and also our networks from threats. So one of the ways that we do that is by deploying technologies, and, and we, we essentially rely on those technologies to protect us. Next generation firewalls or previous generation firewalls, WAFs or email filtering or endpoint protection, the list goes on and on. So this also right now goes across our current on-prem deployment and all the way to our infrastructure as a service and in cases in our platform as a service. What they all have in common is that all observe the traffic and the, or the behavior and make decisions to either allow or deny. And that decision is made based on their individual view of the world or their definition of what is malicious or what is benign. For example, most of us, if not all of us, have already blocked SMB traffic on our perimeter firewall, so there's almost no use case for it to be open in the internet, or, or towards the internet. So, and when the eternal blue vulnerability came, at least you had one less vector to worry about. So that's an example of a, a simple and very effective configuration that you made on that piece of tech to, to protect yourself. It's funny, when I was doing these slides, I did a showdown search on TCP 445, and you can still see around 1.7 million hosts just, just listening on that port, which, which you don't know what to make of it. Is it just all uh, honeypots that researchers have brought up to see how the world's doing, or are there really enterprises or end users? Hard to tell. So not, not every detection is as simple. So imagine a customer who is shopping for a selection of wine from Yarra Valley, which is a very nice place in Victoria. So they add it to the cart. The customer then puts in the delivery address and say that's number blah, Union Lane, three, Victoria 3000. And they click next. And then they see this page which tries to mimic the look and feel of the website, but it fails to blend in. It has a 403 error with a long reference number there. And it's, it's, it's actually telling the customer write it down and give us a call, we'll definitely look at it. And of course you would. So the, the funny thing is the, the, the customer can still buy beer or any other type of wine. Or they can actually ship that product to their mom's address. So you'd think, oh, this is probably a parental control, but it's very advanced, but we'll, we'll find out. So under the hood, you have something like this. It says what the product is, was what the address is. It, it still looks fine until you get the WAF to look at or to apply some SQL injection signatures to it. In, in its mind, you would have there's three keywords that it cares about. It's there's union, select, and from, and the combination in that area is probably a bad thing. So it's just going to drop it and show you that page. So before you get angry at me, yes, signatures could be tuned, but the point that I'm trying to make here is false positives are hard to spot and are difficult to cater for proactively. So what we have learned over the years is that single device view of the world is incomplete. So what can we do to have a wider view of what's happening or a panoramic view of our network? Interestingly, we, most of us are already collecting a lot of what our devices are observing 
and sending them to a central location that that we call scene. And we have a combination of people and processes or use cases or rule sets that are that are massaging the data and turning them into a sort of an intelligence for us. And we, we apply data enrichment and correlation and those sort of techniques to build a more complete view of what is actually happening. So, so, we, can, so we can tell what is malicious and what is benign. But, but the problem is that that intelligence exists outside the brain of the device that's doing the actual enforcement. So the challenge is, then is, if I know what I want to drop, what I want to block, but I have to tell some other devices, and I have to do it very quickly, and I have to be able to do it frequently so I can update it as fast as I can, because that's what it makes sense. Um, and it can also extend across my on-prem or my cloud, how, how can I do that? And, and this is where automation can potentially help us and, and can really shine. So we gather each device's individual view. We then use our people, processes, and technology on the side to, to help us to pr and produce, a, combine it all together and build a more complete view of how things are actually working. That, that produces us an, an actionable intelligence or that we, you, can, you can also call it your own threat intelligence feed, which, which is essentially a list. It could be based on source IP addresses. It could be based on, webs, um, let's say, uh, web session IDs. Or in more advanced cases, it could be a user or a device fingerprint. That's how you ad identify the threat. And it's, it's essentially dependent on the, your enforcement point. So what is the capability of the enforcement point? What can it work with? You turn that into a list and you put it on a source repository. That's where you can then share it with your other platforms. And you can then point your automation service to it. Let's say um, you're using Ansible for automation. So you find an Ansible module for your enforcement device, or if, if it's missing, you just build one, develop one. Most of the devices already have API. Just create a wrapper around the API and turn it into an Ansible module. And then your automation will pick up that list. It understands it. It kind of translates it into what the, the protection device can do. So you, then you can update it, or all your devices or multiple devices from many vendors or across uh, many locations and as frequently as you would like it to. And, and after that, what, what, we, what we do, we just continue to watch what is happening and we update that list and we know that the list will be propagated all the way to our protective devices. Um, I'd like to share some, some considerations here with you. So the first one is to, to test this system vigorously. So fitted the whole internet address space to it, all the whole session idea space to it. Let's say test the device limitations, feeding correct data to it, find what it does, test it at different times of the day or day of the week or month, or test it in the year 2050 and see how it behaves. So make sure it's as bug-free as it possibly can get to. And it's very critical. Implement a whitelist. So this is to avoid accidental blocks on important sources. And also the fact that there will always be exceptions to the, to the normal treatment. So you, you have trusted sources such as 
let's say, your proxy servers or your monitoring platforms or those sort of areas, or even a temporary pen tester that you want to have access to test some of your stuff and you don't want to block him. Have a kill switch. So manual override is not only necessary for airplanes. Everywhere that we have automation, we have to have a way to say everything can stop or I can take over completely. If you have reliable same use cases that can distinguish malicious from benign and you, you trust them, you've tested them, you can connect that detection engine to your automation. So as soon as it's detected, it goes all the way and actually block the threat. So again, you just have to make sure you, you, you're not rushing it. You've tested it in parallel. You've made sure it's, it's as bot free as you can get to. Give your security operations center an ability to, to view the outcome and the way that the automation is working, just to give them the confidence that um, pe human can still do exception handling. If, if there are issues, there is someone watching and can go and use the kill switch or record it as a bug and deal with it. Change advisory board. So they are there to protect the business from cowboys in IT. So automation does look like a threat to them, and they, they will be skeptical of what automation can do, and more to the point, what automation can break and how it can break the business. So they, they most care about the change risk than anything else. You, you need to educate them and build confidence that can be achieved through a number of things. You can have, you can run workshops about automation, just educate a bit about what it can do and what it cannot do, and also take them through your testings and all the controls that you've implemented are pretty much the things that we've talked up until here. That, that, that should give them a bit more confidence that you're, you're not that cowboy. Definitely review and even do a proof of concept for security orchestration, automation, and response tools that are in short SOAR. So this is a classic buy versus build. So there are pros and cons on both. So in, in the right answer is it depends. I'll, I'll, I will probably be a bit biased towards the use of generic automation tool set. And I have more pro arguments uh, for using a general automation tool. But so SOAR tools do promise a lot of good things. But they, they don't support everything right out of the box. So you will see platforms that they don't support or they, have, they even have no plan to support. And you will end up with something that you either have to pay to be built or you have to build it yourself, like a module or a plugin. Even the supported devices, you, you still have to integrate it. So it's, it's similar to what you do with your own automation. The, the other benefit of using general automation is that you're not just limited to, to use SOAR in a classic response um, method. So you can use your general automation to do uh, other BAU activities. So you're, you're not just focused on security operations center and how they react to day-to-day -day threats. The second use case that I'm going to, uh, you guys are going to see shortly is a proactive security control to implement WAF in front of API gateway. So again, I'll try to set the scene. So reality check number one. So most of people in this room are probably using DevOps practices anyway. So teams will um, ramp up quickly and develop the code and pretty much automate a lot of stuff all the way to deployment. Because deployment, and especially deployment in production, and automating that is, is not a trivial task. It's, it takes a lot of effort and there are just so many moving parts. 
So you can elect not to automate that part, but if, if you consider something that is changing very frequently, you need to get ready to hire because you will need an army of techies to, to go and do all of those things for you. Especially if you're in security operations and you're still manually implementing your security controls, um, you, you'll be called a roadblock. That's probably not the first time that we've been called a roadblock, not, not going to be the last time either, but that the pressure is going to get to you anyway. So reality check number two. So a WAF generally is not an easy control to provision and maintain. So you've seen examples of um, signatures that could generate false positives or even false negatives. And for a WAF to remain relevant, you have to maintain it. And if you fail to maintain it, you would either lose your protection or you, you would stop the business, or both, which, which is not great. And, and of course, there are better tools available to us now after maybe 10 years of dealing with these to, to better tune them, but it is a still a difficult piece of kit to maintain. So now, get ready to panic. So when we combine these two together, you get this, and, and that's an abstraction of my face when I first heard about what, um, what the intention is to have WAF in front of an API gateway which changes many days, ma many times in a day. So you either have to forfeit the security or just crumble under the load, which, which you would end up in, in something like this with an API. It's just going to be a mushroom field because just, they're going to spring from everywhere and you can't really control them. And this is a very disturbing thought. So there is a silver lining and when we look at service-oriented architecture and microservices and agile delivery method, you with, with more of a positive lens, we can, we can identify some, some invaluable opportunities. So the first one is microservices are modular and fine-grained. And that's, that's what we like in security. So as opposed to a monolithic web app that, that pretty much does everything, and it's very difficult to understand it, and for that reason, it's, it's hard to secure it, Microservices are atomic, so they're, they're simpler to understand, which, which makes them theoretically easier to secure. With DevOps, you, we can communicate our security requirements earlier, and as they said, as they said shift, shift the security to the left. So you would piece off your developers less, so I'm coming from a software development background. For me, the two, the two things that I always hated was expectation without consultation and restricting rules that gets in the way of your creativity or your experimentation. And we will see examples of this for, um, in, um, in this slide. We also get a chance to bring feedback from production environment where we are battling with threats and real-world issues and bring all of those back into our lower environments, which means there are going to be less surprises the next release cycle. The next one that can help us is we can use API specs or API blueprints. So depending on the API development framework, things like um, open API or RAML or Apiary. So you can use those to encapsulate some key pieces of information for the security team. So what was previously had to be discovered when you wanted to do WAF onboarding and you, you had to look at the traffic and find out, oh, what is this field and what type of data existed it. Now, what you can get the developers to record it in a way that your 
machine or your software can read, so in, in those type of format. While way back, while they're discussing the specification of the API, so we're talking about the design phase, and they have the data provider and the API consumer in the room. So that's the time that you actually identify those. Some example of this could be, as I mentioned, the type of data that you expect to see go uh, to be sent or received by the API, or things like HTTP methods. So what do you expect to see there? So the extensibility of the API development framework with a little extra work from the developers early on in the process could help us bridge this gap between development and security teams. And last one, infrastructure as code. So there's, there's nothing but code. The, the WAF configuration should be part of the release that delivers the product and nothing separate. So, and WAF false positives are similar to software bugs. You just discover them and you, during testing and you debug them and you do deal with them the same way that you deal with your code. This way you're, you're essentially speaking a common language and, and blend well in the delivery. So your security actually exists in the CI CD pipeline. Now let's have a look at how we build the WAF policy for an API and, and automatically deploy it. So the policy constitutes of three main components. The first one is a template for, for base protection. So you will keep common settings across all your APIs in this section. So things such as maximum header length, let's say, or allowed characters in the header. Um, mandatory headers, like you definitely want to see host names, or you definitely want to see a JWT token, or how do you want to deal with multiple encoding, how many rounds of encoding you want to enforce. So all of those things just go into this section. You can also enable some um, highly accurate signature protection for the backend server. So the security team is responsible to develop this. It, it doesn't need to change that much or frequently, but, but it gets reviewed and updated periodically. And how do, we, how do they need to provide it? It has to be in a code format. So in a format that you can keep it in a source repository, you can use a text editor to edit it or read it, you can compare different versions, and if you need to, you should be able to merge it. Things like JSON or YAML will do really well. The next part is the API-specific component. So this is based on what the API publishes and other metadata related to the API. For example, if you decided to enforce data validation based on the content length or what characters are allowed for that specific field, you would need the API developer to capture this during the API design, and, when, and when that's when they're talking to the data provider, so they have access to those sort of information, and they will record it in the API spec. Or, as I, the other example that I already mentioned, um, HTTP method, Is it, does it only support get, or put, or delete? You, you will know and you will have all of that in the API spec documented way before it gets to the, to the security. Or other, other metadata, for example, does this API need to be geofenced or is this an internal only API? These are again sort of things that can be fleshed out during the design phase and you can, have, you can use the extensibility of the API framework to document it inside the API spec. And the last step, you capture any manual changes that need to be made to the WAF configuration. For example, if you need to deal with a false positive or um, if you got a feedback from production that you had to do things or make changes, you want to collect all of that and make sure you just add it to this mix so we, we then end up with consistent environments across 
dev and test and UAT and SVT and pre-prod and prod. Again, the security team provides this and they turn it into a code. So eventually, your configuration builder just combines all of these three components and just gives you the final policy for that specific API. And that will be a single JSON file that you keep it in, in your source repository and that's beside the rest of the code for that API version. And then from there, your automation engine can, can essentially go and read that policy and translate it into the WAF language. And it can, and this is again, if you're using, for example, Ansible, you could have modules wrapper, wrapping around the WAF API and then push this configuration for that specific API to the WAF to whichever environment that you're targeting. So hopefully all of that made sense. I would like to share, again, a couple of more considerations here. First one is having a sign-off process for what is published as part of the API design would be a good idea. So this ensures that the organization knows what is exposed and why you're exposing that. So treating the WAF false positives or false negatives as software box, so record them, track them, debug them, and test them. So you would ideally want to have your automated testing tools or dynamic or interactive application security testing tools to create tickets, for example or bug reports for, for their findings, so you can go and remediate them. Whether you keep the WAF instance in the development area in block mode or in learning mode, um, that is, is a critical choice, but it's, it's your call. It's, it's an organization decision to do that. I'm just going to go through this quickly. So. Um, discuss your, with, with your API development team, upfront in the process, discuss um, how you want to arrange the API URI path and the hierarchy. For example, do you want to have namespaces, a slash platform, slash version, and then API and then method? So, because it has to work for both. Talk to your WAF vendors and, and just make sure you know their limitations. There could be limitations around the size of the policy or the number of policies that you can push to those devices. And based on that, you need to have a scale-out plan, which, which you, we shouldn't, you shouldn't need it um, on day one, but usually if you have it before you make your release, in the future you're going to have less trouble changing things around. And last one, participate in every step, so be in the pipeline, so for initial release, for subsequent maintenance release, and for decommission. This is the last slide, so you know, I'll ask you to pay more attention to this one if you've been distracted with other stuff. The first one is get your tool set ready. So you research your automation tool and other DevOps supporting tools. You would rather use a tool that your organization is already using rather than going out and bring yet another platform that works in parallel. So bare minimum, you would need an issue tracking system, a source code repository, and obviously an automation or orchestration tool. Talk to your vendors, so ask them for development, temporary, or consumption-based licenses. They could, that could save you a lot of money, especially in a multi-environment deployment. Also, ask them to review your architecture, review your code, and, and assist you with their products API. That can save you a lot of time. We've bashed this to death, so but I can't emphasize on this enough. Test it over and over and test it again. And the last one, 
integrate with your change management system, educate and speak to your change advisory board members. You, you need to be able to provide visibility to the rest of the IT and the business and fill them with confidence that you have your checks and balances in place. That's the end of the presentation. If there are any questions, happy to answer. We may have time for one quick question while we set up for the next presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Or questions singular? Nope, okay. Excellent, thank you very much, Ali. Thanks, guys. Give him one, another thank you applause, please, guys.